us online and to say that today we're going to have a session on our pastor via the Q&A. Of course, how many of you in church are excited? If you are excited, say glory. Say glory. Now, if you have your questions or you have something bothering you on what is currently happening in the world, we had a few questions with us already. Or perhaps you want to write it down and send it up for analysis, a pastor to respond, the opportunity to do so. Um, I would like you to please be in a relaxed atmosphere, in a relaxed mood, so that you can get the best of today's Q&A, question and answer session. Um, um, I'm going to be anchoring this session with um, our sister. Let's put our hands together for Sister Gloria. Yes. Well, um, we appreciate a few questions. If you have your questions, you can quickly write it now and begin to send it forward. We are going to rise to our feet as I welcome our Father in the Lord, the President and Founder of Spokesman Communication Ministries, Spokesman Sanctuary Hope Church Senior Pastor, and the person of the very Reverend Professor G. A. Rabo. Let's keep clapping. Let's keep clapping. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir, for coming, for being part of us, for being a blessing to our life. Thank you. God bless. Yes. And again, there's a saying that says, behind every successful man is a successful woman. Today we have our mommy in the house. Are we excited, church? Mommy is in the house. So let's put our hands together and specially welcome, let's rise to our feet as we specially recognize the person of Reverend Mrs. Ayodele Rabo. Thank you, mommy. God bless you. We're happy to have you, our mother in Israel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to implore all those at the Airstream to please come forward. If you are not particularly busy or taking care of children, please join us, come closer so that we can have a compact meeting. God bless as you do so. Um, sir, thank you very much. Yes. Um, feel very free to send in your questions. We are going to turn on the lights now for those of us who want to write down something so that you can write questions down. Our pastor is a very busy um, man of God. He combines a lot of things together. And a lot of questions about how to combine work and family and life. Um, I'm going to start with that this evening, sir. Um, you wrote a book, Balancing Life and Work. And in that book, you mentioned that you may not balance life simultaneously, but sequentially. Please, can you throw more light on that so that we can learn how you have been able to balance your life all these years? Thank you so much. Now, um, the, we give God the glory for bringing us together. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Now, I always say that the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. I mean, Jesus said that. And when we are talking of a balanced life, I am not saying that, I mean, you can be balanced and be underperforming. You can be balanced and just be mediocre. So balance here is presupposes that you are making advances in life, but you want every aspect of your life to be taken together. And so that's why I say that I balance sequentially. Now, if I balance simultaneously, I will be talking of becoming an average person. At every particular time, you see my life balanced. But if I say I balance sequentially, 
It means if at any particular time of my life, one part of my life is excelling fast, I will want the other aspects of my life not to be neglected. Let me give you an example. If, for example, you're in a, a busy work in which you have to be at work all day long, and then you know that that work is causing a separation between you and your family. Now, you may decide to say to yourself, I'm going to take a holiday. And during that period, I'm going to have a me time with my wife and my children to catch up the lost hours. So in a sense, at that particular time, we may not be balanced. But sooner or soon, those aspects of my life that are not balanced will catch up with the remaining aspects. So that's what I mean by balancing sequentially and not necessarily simultaneously. Can make that clap better for the Lord. Thank you very much, sir. Um, our next question is, okay. Pastor, your, mes your messages keep talking about building your inner man and not being perturbed by external within. I have tried and tried, but it seems unrealistic. My marriage is at the verge of crumbling due to my wife's intention to relocate. My career is being threatened. Recent reports about my health are also disturbing. I don't know how to keep calm in all this. Pastor, I don't know if you really understand what I'm going through. I need help. Now, there's a, a simple scripture that says, if you faint in the time of adversity, your strength is small. And so what I'm saying there is simply this, that you keep building yourself so that you can meet with the pressures outside you. So it's not that building yourself is not something static. You build yourself to rise up to the occasion. And this is exactly what simply Jesus was saying that I may not take care of the circumstances of your life. Now we have a war in Ukraine. We all had COVID in the world. Um, we have adverse weather conditions. But no matter what you do about these things, they exist. But those who will win are those who are built or fortify themselves so that they can succeed. And one thing that allows us to fortify ourselves, one essential element is the word patience. I, I don't know why God put patience and long suffering as cardinal virtues. And someone was saying that after you have finished, after patience have completed his work, the long suffering take place. And a man called William Barclay said, a Christian comes to the breaking point and does not break. So the Christian is not the disappearance of your problem that is triumph. It's the triumph over your problem in spite of the nagging problems. So the Christian does not conquer the problem externally but he doesn't allow the problems to conquer him internally. And so from time to time, the Christian has what I call a, an elastic, he's so, you know, he's, he doesn't have an elastic limit. So once my things come, he learns patience. He learns endurance. And part of the fact that your wife wants to relocate, part of the fact that there is no money, then you switch to endurance, to long suffering. And then the scripture tells us that, I only tell some people this, none of us knows the times and season. We don't know what God has put in his hands. It's just like say, God, you know, give me patience right now. 
Or God, if you don't answer me that I'm patient, I'll switch over to fighting you back. The Bible says we should let patience. You should let patience have its perfect work. In a sense, you and I cannot control patience. Let patience have its perfect work. Because patience is a trainer. I mean, if you're in a gym and you have a trainer, you can't tell the trainer, look, this is too much, I go. He can break the, tra the, 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 can break the training. There was a time I used to ask somebody who come as a trainer. He can break it over bits. But you can't tell him, no, no, it's too much. It will stretch you. But patient is the leader. Patient is the director. So allow patience finish his work that you might be entire lacking nothing. Now, what is the point of your going? If you go to, to you're right, you are impatient, and you want to say, let's go to the travel abroad, I travel abroad, does that solve all your problems? You only, you only rearrange your problems. But if you are fortified with patience, and allow patience does his perfect work, you realize that God is beautiful in every situation. God is not restricted to any time, place, and person. God can give you abroad here. As somebody says, our destiny does not come from abroad, it comes from above. God is trying to teach you through patience that my God shall supply all your need. And if he doesn't supply my need, I will not bow to that temple. Because whether God supplies it or not supplies it, is the Lord of my life. So that is the important thing. Patience is a school for which God alone determines when it's time for you to convocate. Thank you very much, sir. Let's put our hands together for our pastor. Patience is a school which God himself determines when you convocate. Uh, I'd like to quickly say that on Tuesday, sir, Tuesday, a friend of mine who's a consultant uh, in the hospital said that um, in the next five years, five to ten years, we are likely not going to have young consultants. In fact, maybe when we go to one of the teaching hospitals in this country, Nigeria, you may see one elderly person with walking stick who will come to attend to you. Considering the massive exodus of professionals and their brain drain to advanced country, um, so what would you have to say to the consultants that are migrating and also an advice for our government? Because I inquired of my friend, why is it that many people are interested in leaving? And he said that when the supplier tank has been diverted, Whatever is in the pipe is just for a season. The tap will no longer produce water. So, sir, what's your advice for both those who want to escape and then those who are governing um, in this present dispensation? Now, there are many ways I look at it. Now, since this question was asked in the context of the medical profession, now, as a teacher of medical students, both undergraduate and postgraduate level, I always tell my students, you must have the opportunity to get your training at the highest level to build up capability. Now, in the past, in this country, I mean, not too much, in the immediate past, Postgraduate doctors have two aspects of training. When they reach a certain level, they are sent what they call a year abroad. When they are taught new skills and exposed to different kinds of disease that they're not seeing, and also learn some soft skill required to practice medicine. Over time, this becomes very difficult because it was funded possibly by the government. Then it came to a time when 
the skills of those who are advanced in the country are required, usually in the Middle East. And many, there was a flood of Nigerian physicians who went to the Middle East. But after a while, that thing plateaued because the first flood of salary, which was very high, began to be down to the much. Then there were other initiatives we initiated from abroad itself, in which people from the underserved country, underdeveloped country, or developing country go abroad and have some training, and then they're supposed to come back and impact the people. During my own time, I had a scholarship where I was expected to be one year abroad, although it was extended to two years, I was expected to come back. The thing is that you cannot predict how these things flow. All these things come in circles. So you cannot say, a time will come and everybody will be abroad. It doesn't happen. Because two days ago, I was in a conversation with one of my colleagues who traveled to, is it Fiji? I can't remember. I had Fiji, one of these islands. And they worked for about five years. After a while, they now brought, promulgated a, a, I don't know whether to call it a decree or something, to which you said, if you are not from that particular island, you are not allowed to practice. So he has to relocate back to South Africa. He finished everything in the South Africa, he got everything. Then he now learned that in South Africa, I don't know, that's his own version, I'm not saying I know that, that they do not give you a job except you are in South Africa. Not even permanent residence. As a little fact that he has done all the exams and passed it, he is stuck. Now, he was not talking to me, he was going to go to another island he had his opening up. I can't remember the island now. And he said, on looking back, he regretted because he was working in Lagos. When at the time Lagos sacked, there was a mass sack of doctors. And he was among those who left the country that period. I know of many people, Nigerians who are also training abroad, whose career has been totally destroyed because they went abroad with the desire that they will get greener pastors. I didn't have one. Some of them have passed the exams, but because of immigration regulations, are not having jobs. Some of them have passed the exams, or because they've been so long in the profession, they don't want to take people who have been so long, they want fresh graduates. So abroad has never been a solution. Now, I asked somebody, I said, well, what of Saudi Arabia or Kuwait? You also informed me that the regulations are catching up with the Middle East. That now they are lying, but as soon as they find someone who is as good in their own place, you are marginalized. And so the child of God doesn't have a fixity of opinion. This is what I see myself. Anywhere you find yourself, make the best of it. And then why pray that God should open opportunities for you between the period of when God opens opportunity, make the best of it. I mean, I, I can't be a doctor here or a teacher here or an engineer here and abandon my skill, abandon my training simply because I'm looking for a dinner pastor. I can't count how many people I have met outside the country who are frustrated. I know of a doctor who is doing security guard and has left the country for about five, ten years. He's doing security guard. I know of also many doctors who have switched profession to the nursing profession. I know of doctors too, very brilliant doctors, who are now drug reps. So it's not a very, you know, I remember there was a particular do, a man who had a PhD. And he was 
it was um, I don't know I don't I don't think they call it a driver in America, but let's call it driver. He was driving an ambulance for a medical home. And the man was quite old, I think he was in, past his forties. So I said, well, you have a PhD, why not go back home? And no, 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 say that he was an academic. He got his PhD and he wanted to come back, um, he got this thing. Now he's stuck that he doesn't even have money for the play. And moreover, his children are in school. Where can he go? So for a child of God, there are no greener pastors. It is as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You must make sure, you must make sure that you have counted the costs. I also, you must make sure that God is leading you. Because if you don't count the costs, you'll be worse than your state. I know people who for the past 40 years, I mean 40 years, have not come to Nigeria. Maybe they, went, maybe they went abroad when they were about 30. They are now 70. They don't have papers. They have never visited home. They have their husbands or their wife. They've never visited home because they cannot. Some of them have been talked to. They say they don't want to miss all their pension and so on and so forth, but they're not getting anything. And so invariably, they may just die, come back when they come home. So it's not always a very rosy picture. Moreover, even if you are in those countries, you just have to work for your money. I know of America, especially. In America, you just cannot have it easy. I have um, my spiritual daughters and sons there. And one of them was telling me that, sir, I can't even go on a holiday. Because if I go on holiday, I won't be paid. So she has to be working almost 24 hours. Yes, she earns a lot, but it's no joke. Some of them have been there and they have had litigation problems and their license have been seized. They say, the lady who finished in the institution, not very far from us, who's in jail, the doctor. She's in jail now. So what I want you to know is this. Make the best use of what you have. Excel, I used to say, bloom where you are groomed. But if God is leading you to go out, he's going to keep you. But don't follow a mass exodus. I believe that things always happen in floods. There's a time everybody says, oh, that is what is, that's the vogue. There's a time everybody wanted a green card. All of us were doing lottery until Nigeria got the ceiling point, and nobody's doing green card now. And people have to travel to other places, disown their country, and they say they're from Sudan, so that they can qualify for a green card. But it's not so. And actually, if you're in the wrong place, you would, when you see people who are in the right place, you'll be jealous of them. Because you ask yourself, what do you have they don't have? They can travel abroad. Some of them own houses abroad. They spend their holiday, their own house abroad, and they can come here. And you wonder how are they doing it? So a child of God must follow what God leads him and what God directs him. I've always said to someone that if you are young, don't be lazy. You must. I have multiple source of income. Now, Take my word rightly, I'm not saying I'm very rich or I have a lot of money flowing with me. Before somebody say, Pastor, please. I mean, I remember during the um, anniversary, my birthday, somebody wrote me, say, Pastor, you would have hit up to a million naira. Please give me some. No, it's not so. But what I'm saying is that I don't sit down. This is why I find I'm a pastor and a physician. And my wife knows it. I don't just sit down and lie down and say, Less salary come. If a salary can meet my need, I'm always thinking, working hard, and looking for ways to enhance myself. 
You know, I'm like Paul using a tent maker business. How can I enhance myself? What can I do? Because I know there's a time is going to come, no matter how I struggle. From about 45 onwards, you begin to get weaker, 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 weaker. 50, weaker, weaker, weaker. 60, weaker, weaker. 65, very weak. All this idea you tell yourself. At 70, very, very weak. You know what I mean? And you should watch. When people are 75, they sit down, they sleep almost all throughout the prayer. So you'll not be able to work hard. So now that you are young, and let me tell you, most of the jobs that people here will not do in this country, what would they do outside? They sweep floor, they sweep toilets, you know? They do all kinds. So make the best of what you have here. And if God opens the door, make the best of the doors that God has opened. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our destiny is, is not from abroad, it's from above. Thank you very much, sir, for that powerful word. Now, now, sir, there are some people that often say that their spirituality is between them and God. They don't serve in church, they don't even come for services. These people can be our brothers, our sisters, our close relatives, sometimes our parents. Now, what do you think about such people, and what can we, um, what response can we give to such statements? Well, you have the option to do anything you like, but you don't have the leisure of controlling your cons your consequences. Christianity is not a liberal religion. It's not a religion of our fantasy. It's a religion with rules and regulations. The commands of God are commands and not suggestions. And the Bible says clearly, do not forbid the gathering of one another, as some do. And the same Bible the man quoted, where the Bible says, our fellowship is with the Father and with what? One another. And every time we see a God word in the Bible, we always see a man word in the Bible. So I think that what that brother is doing or sister is doing is what the Bible, what theologians call heresy, you know, is false doctrine. And he may not realize it now until he starts seeing the consequences because we, we are called to be together. You know, we, we have a bonding together. And we are inseparable for one another. I need you, you need me. That's part of grace given to us. You can't be on your own. You know what I mean? The Bible says, how blessed and how good for brethren to dwell in unity. And then it now ended up by saying, it is there that God commands his blessings. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles, God added to them such that will be saved and bless them because they are together. People always say that snakes are killed because they walk alone. You know, somebody was once said, that, look, I better, if you have a hundred sheep, a thousand sheep led by a lion, I would prefer to follow that sheep than a thousand lions led by a sheep. So God puts us in a place when we have leaders that will direct us who are stronger than us. The Bible says, let those that are strong bear the infirmities of them that are weak. Thank you very much. So let's put our hands together for our daddy. That's a powerful word. Um, so this is the era of prophets. Some people... They are associated with ministry where their pastor sees things, you know, you see things. And what, what's your take about prophets? And then, um, which one do you think, as Christians, we should um, take as priority? Is it the word or prayer? Which one is more powerful? Is it prayer or the word of God? And what's your take on prophets? Oh, oh, so there are two questions. Yes, sir. Now, 
Well, the phenomenon, uh, what I mean by phenomenon are the kind of things we hear now about prophet and prophet and prophet and prophet. It's very new in the Christian faith. Now, I can explain to you the two ways, two places I ordinarily I know about prophet. There's the gift of prophecy, which is in 1 Corinthians 12. And then Paul told us that that gift is for exaltation, for edification, and then for comfort. That gift essentially is the word, you know, spoken through the agencies of the Holy Spirit addressed to a particular situation. It's always biblical, it's scriptural, and it's sound. Then there is the ministry gift. And why we talked about the five gifts. I mean, if we call it, not that Paul wrote it as a ministry gift, but because of the way it was mentioned. It says some are called to become, I hear some, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and shepherds or pastors. Apostles, they open, they are like pioneers. They open, they open a territory and they plant. Prophets are more or less interventionalists. They bring God's word and they are translocal, but they belong to a church. A prophet doesn't really head a church. He prophesies to a church and he prophesies to the world, the voice of God. Now, a teacher is translocal. He can be, he can be domiciled in a church, but he goes out. Evangelist is for the world and plaster. You see, prophet in the way we understand it in this modern world, when a man can tell you, um, this is your card number, uh, this, 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 you know, your wife wore a green dress on, on Wednesday, or you have 2,000 naira in your account, you know, you the, 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 the comb you used was yellow yesterday, eh? and um, you had your period, a week ago, it was very heavy. Now, I, I think I still do not understand how it's very biblical. It could be, but I don't understand it. Now, there is something we call clairvoyance, and they've been existing a long time. What they do is to just they see, they peer into the future. So, God, anything you are predicting about anybody must be relevant, must be scriptural. So just going to tell somebody, look, this happened. No, no, that's not so. We have it in our native culture, which the man will predict and predict and things, and, the, and then in psychic, the psychics, extrasensory perception, where somebody can just tell you what is happening to you, where you went to. I give an example one time. I went to Miami, and I was looking at my palm, and the woman said, do you study palms? So that one is a gray area I don't understand, and I would rather not... Um, I would advise people to tread cautiously when you have those kind of, you know what I mean, those kind of things. Well, you cannot say which is more important, the word and prayer. You know, the Bible says it is sanctified by the word and prayer. You see, a man said he pastor for 40 days and 40 nights that God should speak to him. And all God, all God told him was in the book of Ephesians. And Jesus Christ says, if you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you shall ask whatsoever you will, and it will be done to you. So you cannot separate the word from prayer, neither can you separate the prayer from the word. So when you are only praying without the word, you go into heresy. When you are reading the word without prayer, you go into academic theology. But when you pray and then you use the word, you're going to sound doctrine. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so this question just came in. The question says, 
What do you do when God is leading you to a lady older than you in marriage? At least two years. Well, as a matter of fact, two years, anybody who is within two years bracket, they are really, they, I can say they are pairs. You know, it's, um, it doesn't really, I'm, talk, I'm not talking scripturally now, I'm talking of sociologically, that two years before, two years ahead, it's not particularly a big problem. And um, I know you will say, well, what if we are 50 now, she looks like my grandmother and then, and I, or, <laughs> or, but that would take about five, 10 years gap. I think age is in your mind, your mindset. Reverend Elton, my mentor, the wife was older than him, and they lived a very brilliant life. It didn't matter to them. When they troubled him. So I don't think that is the issue. Now, you said if God is leading you, and then if God is leading you, God is leading you. Yes. That's God is possible. God can even turn, make you at the age of 70, look at 30. No, so I think, I think the aim should not, you should not worry. The first thing is to look at other indices okay. that consolidate your home. Put them all together in the right proportion and then see the age. Except you tell people that your wife is four years older than you, who will know? So you will not tell. Like my wife is always looking young. He will tell you now that she's 40 years. You won't, you won't be. <laughs> yes, yes, so it's not, it doesn't matter at all. So is, that, is it like a practical wisdom to handle such relationships? There's no practical wisdom. What I mean is the practical thing that if you want to marry, marry. If you don't want to marry, tell God to change it. <laughs> There's no practical wisdom to it. Love the wife you are married. If you say God, or tell the Lord to adjust his age. <laughs> no practical wisdom. I feel within the two years, I'm not talking of any street, within the two years, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. People have many hypotheses. You don't want, um, I want a younger person to respect. You know, if a younger person can even hit you on the head, why the more mature person may be kind to you? You will just... Very respectful, so I think we don't know. Just marry the woman God has given you, marry the man God has given you, and just love her and forget it. Don't go and be checking her best educate. Thank you very much, sir. We are blessed to have you. If I um, we have this question from the international stage, okay. few minutes ago, certain missiles were released into Ukraine by Russia. And so some Christians somewhere close to Ilefe are saying this might be this end time. They're already praying and praying and praying. So sir, what do you have to say about this? Is it, is this eroding the end time? Or should we expect, is it beginning of another third war? What is the problem? Because Russia troops are seriously armed to the teeth as we speak now, and that they have entered Ukraine. Well, I'll just give you a simple advice. Watch and do what? And pray. Now, people always say that the Second World War came because Europe was invaded by Hitler. Actually, Hitler was praised by many European leaders to be a very great man, a very wonderful man, until the man started invading Poland and all the rest places. The issue about Ukraine is this. The Soviet Union have all these countries under them before. And they've lost all these countries. And some of them have joined what they call the NATO force alliance. And there is a treaty which says if you touch any of these countries, you touch the whole of Europe. And then Ukraine is so close to Russia. And Russia is afraid that if Ukraine joins the NATO, which Ukraine have not said if you not join or join, that they are not safe. And if there's a war between the NATO forces and the Russians, 
is a bloody war. It's a nuclear war. It's a doomsday. So, but I think it's so, we should not be too fast to say because they've evaded this, there is second world, I mean, the third world war. But just watch and pray. Just watch and pray. Just watch and pray. I have a question here, sir, from one of us in church. He says, Pastor, thank you for always leading by example. So you make life seem so easy by asking us to commit everything to God. Where do we now come in, in terms of contributing our quota? Are we just going to leave everything in God's hand and relax, or how? Well, somebody once said that when you pray, pray as if everything depends on God. And when you walk, walk as if everything depends on you. But in between, let your presence interact with God's prayer. And let God's, and get God's intervention intervenes with your work. When I said commit everything to God, I'm telling from my own experience. I really mean it. I want, I like, I commit everything to God. And then I wait for the signal. I mean, we are just finished a seminar now. I wrote with, was it on Tuesday? It was on Tuesday, yes, it was on Tuesday. One of my colleagues, or Monday, I can't remember, Monday, was saying that I should give a seminar to them. And I just said, well, rather than giving a seminar for just the 10 of you, let me give a seminar to the whole world. So on Tuesday or day about Wednesday, we sent out this, this flyer. And people all over, Canada, US, my friends from Canada, US, all have been sending me notes. Over 100 people were there, that platform. Just two days. Now, on Wednesday, I had planned and written a lot, and that's what I were right. But on Thursday morning, I woke up very early, and I started scripting it. Now, I have prayed, it's just two days. God, give me inspiration, God lead me. But I didn't fold my hands. I still worked hard. But when you walk as if you don't recognize that there are factors in this world you can't predict, and that God worked in us energetically to do several things. Let me just tell you, there's something I, I was doing somewhere. I'm about to start. I said I wouldn't start it because I, I feel I have stopped projects. And I just told my wife that the Lord said I should do it. And to me, it's a very big project. It's not something that I can do on my own. Then I was lying down in my bed, and the Lord just gave me one wisdom. One simple wisdom. He said, do this and do this and do this and do this. And that project would have been half complete. So when you say complete, giving everything to God, doesn't make you passive. Come and let us reason together. So it is listening to God. I mean, just like I see some young men said I propose, it doesn't work. I don't just say, God, give me a wife. I say, God, give me the qualities of the wife you want me to marry. And make me suitable for the wife you are prepared for me. And then I ask God, how do I get about it? Do I propose? You know what I mean? What is the strategy I will use? So prayer is not passive. Prayer is mobilizing heaven's resources to bear on the circumstances of your life. We can make that clap better. Complete everything to the Lord, not some, but all. Thank you very much, sir. Mm, sir, there's, um, this um, question of purpose keeps arising. Some people are like, they don't know how to discover their purpose. Now, I know of someone that is engaged in so many things, but yet it's like the person has not found his or her purpose. Now, how can one identify 
his purpose or her purpose amongst all the things that he or she is doing. One of the greatest revolution, two of them, but one of them that changed my life drastically was when we were building this church. Budget, work, and things like that. Then the Lord woke me up one morning. You can see what I'm saying, that when you are a child of God, there must be this 24-hour interaction. He says, he put it for one, he read it for another. He tells you build, he tells you pull down. I mean, I was building somewhere, the Lord said, stop it. For three months, I stopped it. Three years, I stopped it. If I want to go to the building and look at it very, very, I'll be miserable. But he said, stop it. Then one day, now told me, go again. And in nine months, the whole thing was complete. I wasn't stopping it to gather money. I was just listening to a signal. So I only tell you that the greatest rule in Christianity is listening to instruction. So one of these days, as I was praying, the Lord told me, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail over it. You are the pipe, and I am the pump. You are a transmitter. You know, why I'm really the thing. So, all you need to do is, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done according to what? Your word. And so, purpose is not, purpose is not what you um, yearn for, it's what you discover. And you discover it as you relate to God. And when people think about people, they're thinking about the big thing. Do you know that God's purpose for you now may just be that you should be arranging these flowers. But many people think that the purpose must be that they are pastors or they own a ministry or they own an institution. It's not so. Look, while I was growing up, everywhere I have served, I always know that God has called me to serve. That is it. Right from my young days, I served. In fact, I slaved. And when I, when I finish a certain level of slavery, <laughs> if I tell you I slave, I really slave. In this town, I never, I never had a car. I never bought clothes. I never changed the furniture in my house. You know, I was just slaving. But that was the, that was the grace. And when God wants to take me to the next level, he prepares the way, makes it easy, and establishes it with peace. Because the Bible says, the effect of righteousness shall be peace and rest. So I don't go say, give, show me my people, show me my people, my people. I, Lord, show me. I want to know my people. I know. I just live a day at a time, and I stay faithful. I stay faithful. Because if you are not faithful in that which is another, how can you be committed and giving that which is your own? And let me tell you about this faithfulness. Faithfulness is not that you clean the house or you, you are a member of the ministry or you are a leader. If God sees in your heart as you are saving a seed of deceit that you are manipulative, that you are not serving sincerely, he will not give you your own. And if you have it, it will not succeed. And so, God must see in you, and I can tell you, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Everywhere and anyone God calls me to save, I don't have another ambition. I don't say I'm serving this church now so that I learn how to serve. I've never done it. Never. I go for it. When I was called to serve in Foursquare, I was among the first people who gave money for the land in Foursquare. And that, today, that's the most prominent building in Foursquare. 
In fact, when they were about to sign, my signature is there. And when issues come, they came to call me because my, my name was Norija. I wasn't saying, Lord, as I'm building this church, that you build my home. Never. So what many people do is that they treat God like, um, they treat God like as if you're apprentice. That Lord, give me my own now as I'm doing your own. No, 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 no. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done according to your word. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let me illustrate you. There was one time in this church, I had this pressure, and I was looking for people to support me. You know, sometimes people say you have everybody around you, but you don't know. So I was looking and looking, and I told the Lord, say, give me more people. The Lord mentioned one person. He said, be satisfied with this person. We are many, we are thousands. I've given you this person. Take it, that's what I've given you. They now reminded me that every other person was there but Timothy. So don't struggle. You know, when we walk with the Lord, in the light of his words, what a glory he shed on our ways. Take it step by step with the Lord. Give him all it takes for any assignment you have been given, do it. And stay faithful. And then God is so good. I think my first trip abroad, in which I had to sit with the gurus of the medical profession, just came because I was in a professor's house, Professor Topley, a lady, a white woman. I went there to have a meeting in the evening. She was a professor of hematology. And then I said something, just simple thing. We went there, gathered, nothing, no ambition. I wasn't thinking of anything. I brought nothing, no, no color. Then Professor Topley looked at me. He said, you have a great insight. He said, Gregory, you will hear from me. That's all. The next thing is that I got a letter from some group of Christians who were trying to organize a program in Cambridge said that they want me to come and that they are going to give me, um, I don't know what they call it, attachment in some London hospitals and I will attend a conference in Cambridge. One of them was, and I had to miss many people. I stayed in one professor's house with Roger. I made a man bucket who was quite a tumor, we went about. And then as I was finishing that training, she has two young doctors, consultants. I don't know if they are called They say, please, they want to make me spend two weeks in their house. That's how I joined them. This woman, we wake up in the morning and wash my pants and singlet. And in those days, I was not particularly too neat, you know? I see how this crude Nigerian way of doing this. She will wash it, arrange everything, clean everything, take me out on shopping. In fact, the Africans were telling me, ah, how you get this so you poor woman? The man will go to job. And so that's how they were doing it. And I stayed with them for two weeks. Then something happened that made us friends forever. My father were in the house two weeks ago. So then Nigerian Airways was still flying. So they give me a lot of books, a lot of medical books, many medical books. And so they now drove me from, I think we were, they were staying in Essex, to Heathrow Airport to go and enter Nigerian Airways. Then I had SS luggage. Because I took them, I had money. You know, Nigeria was having money there. So I bought coats, buy this, buy that, boxes. So, when I got there, they weighed it. They said it's too much, that I have to pay excess luggage. Meanwhile, she has were looking at me from far. Oh, no, the man, not the woman, but the man alone. So a woman called me, saying, mm, don't worry, give us a little amount of money. Because I said, I won't give you. I said, rather than for me to bribe, I'll go back. And they say, you're not going to go. So I now told the Shehans, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to go there because they want me to bribe. Maybe I should go home, 
take another trip later and drop some luggages. Do you know she has not talked to me? 10, 20 years later, I was sitting down in the same house room with them, taking tea. He said, Gregory, he said, do you know where you became our friends forever? It was because of that thing. That is where we became your friend forever. So every year, I'm always in their house. And when I go into their house, they will buy everything for me. We sit down, we we'll go out on cruising, we we'll go on ship, we we'll go everything. There's comfort, everything together. I saw all their children, you know, we're with them. That very thing he observed that you did not bribe. Now, I wasn't knowing, if it's now, because now we're already too wise than, than God. If it's now, I just say, well, I, let's adjust it. But I was still having this original issue. God forbid that I should bribe. <laughs> you know, and they observed it. And that is the typical British for you. So don't worry about the outcome of your life. Stay faithful in anything. You see, there's nothing as bad as people to see that. You see, I, I read something in scriptures where it says, he saved the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. All of us that are serving, God sees it. He saved the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. I want the situation in which God will see me and say that I'm saving the Lord with a perfect heart. And leave it. I want God sees your heart is perfect. He will give you something, a responsibility, a work, an idea. I mean, there's a, there's a government... Um, Panel that I mean, I won't go into details. And only eight of us in the whole country that are there. How did I get there? They were looking for one person. And then somebody suggested two names and suggested my name. The rest is history. Why did he suggest my name? If it's obscure, you don't know anything about it, if there's no anybody can see. So just stay faithful because you don't know what God has for you. You see, I have not seen, neither ear had, what God has prepared for them that love him. Let me tell you, if by the time I got saved, eh, I was just preaching everywhere, starting ministry, I'll be dead. I will certainly be dead. All my mentors who were very active, strong, they didn't live up to 60 years old. I start branches here, start branches here, I'll be dead. You see, be careful of what you are looking for. Because what you are looking for needs a certain degree of life which you may not have. But just stay faithful. You know, you know when they were asking Jesus Christ about John the Baptist, what did they say? No, John. They say, what will this man do? What did John say? Jesus say, what is your business? If I say that this man should stay with me till I come. What's your business? You know? Many times, people tell you, I look at you. You are just going from here to here. You are just, you have no future ambition. Hmm? That's it, though. That's what God says I should do. I will obey him. I will obey him. So, I met one man, one student, years ago. I went to pray. And as I finished praying, the boy met me and said, ah. I met him, I said, he said, Father, pray for him. He said, I said, I should pray for him. I said, what's your ministry? He says, an apostle and a prophet. I said, you are trying. I said, me, I'm just a child of God. She said, what do you say? I'm not an apostle. Ah, apostle, I'm not there. Later, 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 he came to tell me that he has realized what I'm saying. Today, we were about to introduce the program. Somebody said, I should tell them I'm a professor, I'm an investor icon, and this. I started by, I'm a physician, I'm a teacher. Then a colleague of mine in America sent a note. My professor, my pastor, my, he's working as a physician there. So, look, just allow God do the work. 
Do you know, all, as we're all here now, God sees us. God is seeing two of you. If you are doing this thing because you want to show, he sees it. If you are doing this because you genuinely love the brethren, he sees it. If you genuinely sacrifice for his own, he sees it. And in due season, he will reward you. And she saw you in her dream telling her to join an activity group. And that um, you came to her dream and said, what are you doing in church? Join an activity unit and be relevant in church. And since then, she has been struggling to join one. She's been very busy. She's not been able to put it together. I don't know if you have a word or two for her now in real life, not in a dream, to just encourage her to start something in church. Join an activity group. Let me say to you that, uh, don't join. Let me tell you, look, I keep telling you, don't worry about the title of what you are doing. Call what you are doing service. When I was in usage, before I got to usage, I have been president of Edo College Christian Fellowship. I was the president of the Medical Student Fellowship in UI. I got to usage and I joined the drama group. I can still remember that drama. You know? I was acting, I was to speak in somebody's obituary. You know, and I enjoyed it. We practiced, I acted it. So I was glad. You know, I didn't think of anything. Until one day after acting one drama, one of the leaders insisted that I would not be in the drama group. Then I asked him why. He said, because he feels that God wants me to lead the church. To lead the fellowship. Just say, start with the sanctuary keepers. Start with, you know, if everybody goes to the choir. We go choir, you see you. You dress well, you look around, and then somebody can propose to you easily. But I, 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 <laughs> just say with something that nobody will see you. Eh? To me, you see, one of the most admired people to me in this church, the people I admire most are the sanctuary keepers. Just watch them. After service, they will scrub, they will clean. Then the other group is the welfare. You don't know them, but they, you just see them by their service. So just do a simple thing, and then God will promote you. The fact that God started to allow me to appear in the dream, Simply means that you have inconvenienced me because <laughs> that means you maybe you are not listening. I have to come to your dream. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. So join an activity unit today. Okay, so another question is here. It says, sir, you emphasized a lot on openness and trust in relationship. What does someone do in a situation where the person doesn't want to share some particular information, yet or probably never, to a friend who is, on the contrary, very open? This is due to personal nature of the information. Should that person break the relationship? Now, openness eh, is transparency. But to be secretive, I think it's a spiritual problem. I think it's a very spiritual problem. When you keep things, it's a spiritual problem. And when you deliberately hide things, it's deceitful. But bringing out certain informations, you have to think about many things, the consequences, the maturity, and so on. How can you be in a relationship with a person and you're not open? I can tell you, over the many years I've been in this place, the greatest thing that I can't understand, how someone can be a person's friend and keep vital information from that person. I don't know how it works. And you come to church with that person. You eat with that person. I don't know how it works. Sometimes you see somebody says in the church, 
He said, see, seven years ago, I wanted to leave that church, leave you, leave the church. Seven years ago. Ah, and here you confine that everything about your life you give this person. If you cough at all, you go to the person you have coughed. So I don't know. It's maybe when I get to heaven before I can understand. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no relationship when there's no transparency. Basically, forget it. You some day, sometimes were telling me that somebody said, I was speaking one time. I say, I would say, I said I, I can count my friends on fingertips. I said, Ah, Pastor, with all the many people around you, I said no. That my friends, one thing about them is openness. We don't even know what is called secret. We don't know. So my closest friend, if I go out, in fact, one of them came to this church one time, and the wife said that, told him that you know that if you do anything, Greg will hear it. It's not that, mm, ah, I'm not used to that. I don't, know how, I don't know how you can be a Christian and be that. It's so, I can't understand it. And really, those people are dangerous. They are very, very dangerous. And I think if you don't quarrel with them, but keep them a distance. What I now do is, when I notice you are not transparent, I just give you, I keep a distance to you. I was just talking to the, to some group of people, among the people. I said, you told, so, I told somebody something. Very simple, benighting. And the person went to interpret it very well. Dif different. And by so doing, the person has destroyed other people's ability to get close to me. Can't you see that is the demons? Or just if I look at you and I say, your, your, your hair looks like I have to Then you, you, not, <laughs> you not come back, you say, hair. Hey. He says, I'm Boko Haram. <laughs> when I'm just laughing. Then tomorrow now, I will, look, I will I talk. Even if you are going to say, well, God will be with you. Uh, strength of God. I've seen somebody talk to me by say, say, maybe like this. I say, yes, yes, sometimes it could be like this. Ah, I say, how can something be like this? And then be like this? They say, yes, it can be like this. When you say something like this, they say, yes. They go to say, oh, yes, I agree with you. I think it has no place in the Christian faith. That doesn't exist. Forget it. Thank you very much, sir. This same person asked another question. The question said, Apart from asking for advice and spiritual guidance, does a believer still need to meet pastors for prayers after receiving the Holy Spirit? No, 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 no. The relationship between your pastor is that of a father and a son, or a father and a daughter, especially if those pastors are genuine. But pastors are not your God. And it's exploitative if you totally surrender your life to your pastor. That's not biblical. Your pastors are mentors, they're advisors, they're spiritual guides. And the pastor should not play the role of God in your life. He should rather help you find God for yourself. You and the pastor are co heads with God. He's not superior to you, but he's only superior by, because of the assignment he has given him. And so, that's how it is. Let's put our hands together for our pastor. We have a few questions here before we round up this session. Um, I would like to read. Sir, you have talked several times about thinking and writing down your thoughts. But how do you effectively streamline your thoughts when everything's to be like your thoughts? A lot of them, they are coming out at once. How do you streamline them? That's one. The other question here says, is giving our substance, first fruits, to our pastor, the same thing as giving to God? First fruits to our pastor, is it the same thing as giving to God? Well, let me, somebody was asking me one time, he said that he's afraid to say, God speak to me, God speak to me, God speak to me, God speak to me. Because he said that he knows people have been saying, God speak to me, God speak to me, God speak to me, and they are sick in their minds. 
And then he says, look, he doesn't want to just stay in scripture and normal. But I say it's a very simple thing. If I call it to you and I say, God spoke to me that I should eat beans this evening. Or as I get to the door, say, ah, God said it should be young. Then before I enter your car, you say, God spoke, it should be rice. And then you know I will have to be worried. That God has spoken to you within two hours, beans, yam, and rice. So there are certain parameters of the way God speaks. It must be scripturally, it must also be of a sound mind. Eh? And it must, it must, it must um, be in line with what is acceptable. Very rarely God makes you to do, to give you revelations that are out of, out of the way. So, when I notice that somebody consistently is giving revelations that is out of the way, I'm very cautious. I'm very cautious. And when somebody says, the Lord said, the Lord said, and he wants to say, the Lord told me, I, I get worried. Because God wouldn't force things on you. He won't force things on you. It's of a mild mind, mind, good mind. But the ultimate direction it's for God to make you to have the mind of Christ. That's it. So that even when you stink and speak, you are speaking in line with the Spirit of God. That is the ultimate goal. But between that, we prophesy in part, we speak in part. I know the Old Testament rule. If you prophesy once and it falls, what happens? What is it true? They will stone you to death. Finish. So when the person is giving me four prophecies at the same time, somebody told me that, give me prophecy. Then in October, he told me, Christ, uh, Happy Christmas. Eh? And the same person also told me that God, I, I said, if God, that there must be something wrong. You are telling me God is leading you. And in October, God is telling you Happy Christmas. And let me tell you this. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love of the sound mind. One thing I know, everything Jesus said was sound. Was very sound. When people don't, I mean, let me illustrate to you. Somebody was saying that England will win. England will defeat Germany. That if God, England will defeat Germany, he's not the uh, sound of God. And Germany defeated England. Somebody was predicting that uh, Clinton will win. Big prophecy in Nigeria. God told them that Clinton will win the election. And the Clinton lost. Somebody said that coronavirus will go in a wave. Boom! Wind will blow. Boom! And coronavirus will go. I lasted for two years. So the Bible said, let one prophesy. Let another judge. That's all. So I don't get too worried. When people start saying the law said the Lord, I don't just just relax. Tell me what God said and go home. And if the Lord that is speaking, He will tell me in my spirit. But I will not despise prophecy. Will not allow myself because you have given a prophecy, I will be paralyzed by it. Second one was it? The second one? Yes. The um. Giving first fruits to the pastor, is it the same thing as giving to God? As everyone is persuaded, the Bible says give as you are persuaded. Look, what you don't know, and I got, I'm telling you this, that what I'm speaking to you now is a personal opinion. This year, about five or six people gave first fruit, but two were very, very significant, or three. One was one of the oncoming ministers, and she just dropped it. In fact, she didn't even talk to me. She didn't even greet me. And I know her job. And it was the small first one. The second, there were four of them like that. Another one had the money and said to me, and kept on troubling me, sir, I want to give you this. And that was in December. I refused, I refused, I refused. 
I kept on praying. The government becoming a problem. Then the other one was a couple. And these are people I know have high IQ. And when I, I know what they call high IQ. They are very intelligent people. And two of them brought their first fruit. They didn't even tell me. Hey, well, the husband just told me, please, just take this as a... The wife didn't even say anything. So do you know one day, I was in my office in the night. I started at 3 o'clock. I prayed. I wrote. I walked. I walked. Finished the early morning prayer. I walked till 11. Went to bus doing some projects for the church. And I said, God, you know what the Lord told me? I can see the pains you are going through. I can see the difficulties you are going through. That lady that is troubling you for first will take it. I put it in her heart because she sees your pains. I knew I was in pain. I mean, there, were, there are times this year that everything I had in my account was reduced to 2,000, 5,000. I'm not a poor person, sincerely speaking. So the Lord told me that these people are seeing your pains and they want to partake of the ministry. Sincerely speaking, any genuine man of God, eh, you can't separate him from the church except he's a, except he's a charlatan. He carries the pain. He carries the load. You can't see Jesus. He carries the load. If today this church is raining, it is rain, you will go home. I will be the one to walk, to get worried. If anything is happening to you, you imagine we are an average of 1,200 in this church. Anything happened to any individual, sometimes when somebody is telling me he's traveling, I am shaking all through. Because if anything happens to him when he, when he gets there, they will say, hey, is he in that church? He hasn't got, there's no covering? No covering? Ah, come to our church. So, I think it is semantics to say, should you give it? I remember there's some people who used to be in this church before. They will give you, they will give me money, they will say, they, they will give me a thousand naira, they say, 80, 80 naira is for the church. You take 20,000. <laughs> what does that mean? Just means nothing. But there are some churches that are structured and the pastor is on salary, paid centrally from the church, and everything is undergoing that way, and everything is structured and is done. This church lives on the sweat, the blood, the tears of your leaders. Maybe there's going to be a time when we are stabilized. Maybe that's how God wants it. So, and that's what the Bible says, don't muzzle the ox. Why is trading the vine? Don't muzzle the ox. And it seems to me that, look, let me tell you what happened two Decembers. I went to a place for, what did I go for? I think it was ophthalmology. It was, I think, yes, I was looking for the person who was in charge, the lady who was in charge of that place. So I met this man of God. And I greeted him, Daddy, good afternoon, sir. Because I knew this man of God as far back as when I was in school. So when I got home, the Lord said, I should go and pack money. I'll go and give to this man of God. You know, anything you want to have, I do not believe that when you sow in a life, you reap it. Anytime you need, then the man held the money and shook my hand. Prayed in tongues. God bless him. God bless him. God bless him. He got home again and he called me. No long after that, I was in a program. We had just about five programs. He was the speaker. I wasn't the one I invited him. And I knew nobody would give him anything. 
The Lord said, go to your home. My home was not very far. Wrap money. You know, when I talk about money, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm not talking about 20,000 or 30,000. And drop it to this man of God. <laughs> the man said, what is it again? I said, sir, take it. You see, because I know what this work is, and I know what it entails, so I don't separate it. I don't look at my pastor as equal with me. My pastor buy a car, I bought a car. My pastor build us, I'm a build us. My pastor travel abroad. No, you're not the same. That depending on who that pastor is and the level of your relationship with him. I was speaking somewhere, somewhere, and I said, I only know of three people. Yes, two people really, outside this country. I mean, really two people who give me something very significant at the end of every month. I mean, some people give, but you know, they give a proposal to that. You know, but if you give a millionaire, you give him 500,000. You know, it's not, he won't consider it. But I know of two people. So immediately I finished saying that word, one of my daughters, he just came, she said, sir, I feel, I, I feel grief in my soul. I said, I said, I remember how you labored for me. I remember how you suffered for me. Please, sir, I'm very, very sorry. He issued a check. And I think, I think almost, that was one of the largest snakes I've ever received. They said, from now on, every month, I'm committed to you. So, it is something, you're like your father. You know, when my, before my father died, I was dramatically inclined to help him, my father. Because my father never married another wife. My father was laboring. You come, you go to work, he's at home. He will came us to study. He suffered. They gave me a car loan. He said, we'll not take a car loan because of his children. Ah. So immediately I qualified. I said, I am going to reciprocate. And God being so good, at least I saw my father for about 40 years before he died. And, and I kept on asking him, look, is there anything I've not done? I'll conclude by telling you this story. I told it to my wife yesterday, or this morning. I said there was a man, a man of God. He said he was always giving 2,000 to, to the mother. Every month, 2,000, every month, 2,000 dollars. 2,000 dollars, 2,000 dollars. So one day he called the mom, mom, mommy. I said, ah, mommy, what of the money I gave you last month? He said, it's still there, I kept it. He said, what the one I gave you two months ago? He said, it's still there, I kept it. He said, what the other? He said, ah, the man said, we're not going to give his mother again. He said, mommy, I'm not going to give you. I said, the mother said, you dare not touch my own money. You dare not touch my money. He said, first month he didn't give, second month he didn't give, third month he didn't give, and everything about his ministry paralyzed. He's an American. It's not like us. They, he's a literary preacher. They get money by when they are invited. Say no invitation. No invitation. And he called the mother. He said, I told you, you don't touch what is mine. He said, so that month, he now sent to the mother. I said, everything changed. You know, you know, there are some spiritual dynamics. Nobody knows how it works. We don't know how it works. But we know that it works. And so, to every sacrifice, there is something. And I believe that if you have a minister or a leader who is laboring, not forget about this church, please don't separate it. Don't say, hey, pastor, it is it, it is Give, just give them. Anything that is laid in your heart, as you feel persuaded, just do. If your persuasion is, 
drop at their feet. Good. If your position is drop the church from you and master pastors are ethical, they will not touch it. Somebody sent me some money and he put uh, what do you call it? Not in this church. Oh. He put the he, what do you call it? He photocopied the thing, everything, you know, twenty something thousand naira, bro. So I wrote him acknowledge receipt of your photocopy there. <laughs> he said, no, but no, uh, is it there? I said, I told you, photocopy transfer. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Please, if you are clapping, let's, let's clap properly. Thank you, Daddy, for the powerful answers. Now, I'll just take this last one. It says, um, you've been taking series on time, success, purpose, and prosperity. When Jesus told the man to sell off all his big possessions and give to the poor, does it mean that Christians who are rich or wealthy cannot make heaven? And what is the difference between ambition and dreams? Well, very simple. Riches can be an instrument of spirituality. At the same time, riches can block your salvation. But the Bible says about Solomon, Solomon loved several women and those women turned his heart away from God. So if the Bible says, if riches increase, what did he say? Set not your eyes on it. But if you now make riches your God, you've got your reward. What is the difference between dreams and ambition? Christians don't talk about ambition generally. It's not a word we talk, well, it's an English word, but Christians talk about visions. Visions and dreams. And by using those terminologies, they're saying what God wants you to do for him. Ambition usually is what you want to do yourself. But you can be ambitious to do what God wants you to do. Thank you. You can be ambitious to do what God wants you to do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we want to once again appreciate your patience, and I'm sure you have enjoyed the time with Reverend Professor G. Rabo on this session. Um, so